You're listening to The Business Communicators, presented by IABC Houston. And now your hosts, Austin Stenton, Hattie Horn, and Thomas Bain. Coach Drew and Baylor complete college basketball's greatest rebound and rebuild with a championship. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 20 of The Business Communicators, a podcast presented by IBC Houston. My name is Austin Staten, joined alongside my co-host this week, Hattie Horn and Thomas Bain. On this journey, as we explore the world of communications, discuss the key issues and trends that impact our industry, and today we are going full barbecue. I think it's something that our audience is really going to enjoy, but if you heard the audio that started this episode, it was Jim Nance making the final call about my Baylor Bears winning the national championship game, and I just have to say, we did it. We predicted Baylor to win. It happened. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Congratulations to you guys. It was a long road, but y'all finished, and y'all finished out well, too. He finished up very well. I thought Gonzaga was going to take it, but I didn't realize Baylor's defense was going to come out and just fully lock down, and then they weren't going to miss a three outside of it. But I'm so glad that Austin uh, heeded my advice and wound up going to the game. A last-minute flight. <laughs> it is so worth it. You can see he's still smiling. It's almost been. It will be a week when this episode drops. So yeah, congratulations to Baylor, second national championship in men's basketball in the state of Texas ever. Yeah, and the first one was the uh, Glory Glory Road team out in El Paso, which is now YouTube. Mm-hmm. But what was it, West Texas A and M at the time? Yeah, uh, so, yeah, like that. yeah. But so second team ever, and I'll tell you what, I was really hesitant and on the fence. And Saturday night after Baylor beat the University of Houston, I had several friends saying, "Hey, we got to go, we got to go." And I was looking at flight prices, and they were absurd. If you wanted a full round trip flight, I think it was like twelve hundred dollars from Houston to Indianapolis, and no more than three weeks before, like prior to the tournament starting, those those flights were under three hundred dollars round trip. But we ended up finding a direct flight well, I'm sorry it wasn't a direct flight it was a flight from Houston to Atlanta Atlanta to Indianapolis and I think it was like $200 or something like that on the way up the return flight we ended up driving three hours to Chicago and found a direct flight on United for like $49 so affordability wise it was great and it was definitely a moment that I'll never forget but oh man the airlines companies know their customers because I know when Tech went two years ago to the Final Four, buying plane tickets out of anywhere, Lubbock, Dallas, Austin, to to Minneapolis was just crazy. We had to fly into to, uh, Milwaukee and drive yeah. for the cheap drives. So, Well, for the record, I knew Baylor was going to win. You know how I knew Baylor was going to win? Not just because I like them or anything like that. The entire tournament that they did well, which I love, they played defense. Yep. Defense wins championships. Hear my word. Defense. Very, very true. I thought it was so great on uh, Tuesday when you heard some of the reactions. Everyone was saying, you know, these weren't basketball players. These guys are built like football players. You know, they lift with the, the football team and they love playing defense. And I think the term that I heard a lot describing the Baylor team was these are grown ass men. <laughs> and they they just punched Gonzaga in the mouth. So it was just Jared Butler so and much the three fun. point. My boy, that's my guy. Uh, I love I love me some Davion Mitchell. Davion Mitchell is is amazing. But anyways, we don't want to bore you with Baylor basketball talk. We are not a Baylor basketball sp- sports podcast but we've got a great episode today with um with daniel vaughn and daniel vaughn is the barbecue snob uh he is the barbecue editor for texas monthly and uh, we sit down with him for about 30 minutes and uh, it's, it's just a wonderful conversation everything from the social media angle to uh what actually is barbecue so i think you're going to like that conversation but just as a quick reminder if you want to follow our work we recommend that you follow us on social media just search at biz communicator on twitter instagram and linkedin of course you can subscribe to our youtube channel like the you know like the video smash the like button if you want to reach out to us uh, text podcast at 713-360-0133 or visit our website at thebusinesscommunicators.com but thomas hattie let's go ahead and get into the conversation with daniel vaughn so it's time to sit back relax and be informed. You're listening to The Business Communicators. This week's guest on The Business Communicator is the author of The Prophets of Smoked Meat, A Journey Through Texas Barbecue, the co-author of Whole Hog Barbecue, The Gospel of Carolina Barbecue, and the barbecue editor at Texas Monthly. And most importantly, 
Thomas Bain's idol, uh, but he has traveled the world sampling smoked meats at over 1,800 barbecue joints, most of which are in Texas. Daniel Vaughn, we are so excited to welcome you to the Business Communicators. All right. Well, happy to be here talking with you all. Well, it's, you know, we wish we could do this in person over barbecue, but, you know, maybe maybe once we get past, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. But I'm kind of curious about your background. I mean, you're trained as an architect, and now you're, you really have, like, honestly, one of the best jobs, barbecue editor for one of the most high-profile, you know, and, and well-respected magazines in, in, the, in, the, in the country. How did you come from, you know, the blog of yours to where you are now? Uh, well, uh, yeah, as you said, I went to college at, at Tulane to become an architect. I, I did that. I'm, I'm still an architect, still a licensed architect. I just don't practice. Uh, but yeah, as I after I moved to Dallas, and that was 20 years ago now, moved to Dallas and really just fell in love with barbecue, uh, started to write a blog about it. Um, Full Custom Gospel Barbecue was the name of it. And, uh, and after, I don't know, like 500 or so reviews, uh, Texas Monthly took notice and uh, I started to do a little bit of freelancing work with them and uh, then partnered up with them on a barbecue app. Uh, and then eventually uh, I got it written into that contract that I'd be part of the tasting team for the 2013 top 50 list so we do a, a top 50 barbecue list in texas every four years uh so then the next one will be coming up uh, here at the end of this year uh we're actually meeting about it next week uh to really kick that off kick that search off and um you know at that point uh i was i was a full-time architect but i was also writing a book the, the my first book profits of smoked meat i was doing research for that took a little bit of time off from work uh, I, I took six weeks off from work thinking that was going to make a dent in writing this book. Uh, it didn't. It was really just all research is the only uh, only time I spent uh, or the only thing I did during that, during that time. And so really after that, uh, you know, my interest in being in an office for eight hours a day was waning. And I reached out to Texas Monthly and Jake Silverstein was the editor then. And uh, just told him, you know, if you've ever considered hiring somebody full time for barbecue coverage, like I think I'm ready to make that jump. And a few months later, uh, had a contract proposal, and let's see, uh, it was April fifteenth. Uh, was my first day at Texas Monthly back in 2013. That that is awesome. And and as we sit here and talk barbecue, so our listeners aren't just in Texas, where we have us. Define definition of what barbecue is. I was listening to the Dan Patrick show and watching a little clip on it, and they showed a clip of burgers being flipped on there. Barbecue and burgers, <laughs> while they're both meat, I don't necessarily put them in the same. So, so well, for all it's our funny listeners, that you mentioned that. it's funny that you mentioned that right after I just watched the uh, the Patreon video uh, from Leroy and Lewis doing their most excellent smoked cheeseburger. So they've found a way to like turn a burger into barbecue. They smoke it and then grill it afterwards. But yeah, I'm sorry I interrupted you there. I was just thinking about that cheeseburger. No worries. I've cooked a I've cooked a burger on my personal home home uh, smoker as well. But so so on the authority as as the person who's in charge of all barbecue across the world, what is your definition of barbecue? Uh, well, you know, meat over fire, I think, is uh, too broad of a definition. Uh, but I, I think meat over fire, in which the the fire uh, transforms the meat in some way, other than simply you know getting it hot enough to eat. Uh, so as you said, like a, a burger, uh, I'm never going to put hot dogs on a grill and ask people over. Uh, for a barbecue, right? I, I think uh, in Texas, and I think in, in a lot of other states these days, people are going to be disappointed with that. Um, I, I will say, however, that as I've since I've taken this job and done all the travel, my definition of barbecue has certainly broadened. Uh, I, I think uh, long ago I would have told you that barbecue is something that needs to be if it's if it's cooked in an offset smoker. Uh, if it's done low and slow, um, you know, it's, it's gotta be, uh, it's gotta be large, large hunks of meat, uh, that would otherwise, uh, not be good, hot and fast, uh, you know, put all these parameters on it. And, uh, after I started eating barbecue all over the state and all over the country, really all over the world now, um, it became apparent that that definition was, uh, not only far too limiting, but, historically inaccurate as well. I mean, looking back at Texas barbecue and how it developed, uh, 
people all over the country were cooking large pieces of meat, mostly whole animals over direct heat uh, as the primary form of barbecue all over the country uh, before the 1900s. Uh, as restaurants um, started to become popular in, in the early 1900s and as, as restaurants became more popular, we started to codify uh, these different styles of barbecue and uh, as meat uh, production uh, changed and meat slaughtering and processing practices changed, we started to get those definitions even further down to individual cuts of meat because now individual cuts of meat were available. But before then, I mean, direct heat cooking, um, which really isn't practiced in Texas much outside of the hill country, um, direct heat cooking was the primary way of cooking barbecue. So my old idea that it had to be like, um, you know, an offset smoker, low and slow cooking was way off. And whenever anybody makes that argument to me these days, I, uh, I have to point out to them that, um, you know, places like Kreitz Market and Lockhart, legendary place, uh, Cooper's and Lano, uh, all, all of a sudden these big names of Texas barbecue, they're, they're saying aren't barbecue. And uh, I guess my, my biggest contention is just that if we, if we took all of the things uh, away that people say aren't barbecue, like we wouldn't be left with any barbecue. So, um, you know, Meathead who has amazingribs.com, he's got this, uh, uh, the saying about a big tent, that barbecue should be a bigger tent. And I think his tent's probably a little bit larger than mine, but um, like I said, certainly my idea of barbecue has broadened quite a bit especially since I've taken this job. I, I was reading a, a few of your lists over the years, and some of the uh, um, establishments that you um, had on your list, some of them have actually closed. Some, some They're closed. Yeah. And so it comes down to sustainability. One, do you follow up with them to find out exactly, you know, what happened? Um, are they going to reopen? Or what was the thing that caused them to no longer be in business when they've made this top 50 list and they can't seem to come back from that? Yeah, and it hurts. Uh, you know, we do the top 50, which is certainly uh, seen by most people as, is uh, the, the more important of our list. We also do a top 25 best new barbecue joint lists every, uh, also every four years, but in between our top 50 list. And if either of those, if, if, if places from either of those lists close, it, it really does hurt. Uh, not only for the fact that, um, you know, I, I feel like that sort of designation should do enough to keep you in business. Uh, I also feel like for barbecue fans, uh, you know, they refer to those lists. So anytime one gets knocked off and maybe they're led astray to go to that place uh, hurts a little bit as well. But also for the places that I, you know, um, are number 51 and 52, you know, and to know that they didn't make it on the list or still open and, and could have had a slot. Um, in place of places that closed. Uh, but yes, I do follow up with, uh, with them in every case. And uh, the reason that they close, there's a variety of differences, uh, you know, variety of reasons, anywhere from, you know, the simple health reasons, uh, maybe a, a, the, the pit master, the owner, um, you know, has something go wrong. Uh, sometimes that pit master, sometimes the pit master leaves uh, and maybe an older ownership doesn't really have the, the energy to carry on. Uh, some places are just poorly managed. You know, the, uh, the business practices uh, <laughs> might not always be the strong suit of some great pit masters. So in barbecue, I think especially given the fact that you can really just load a pit up and, and put a tent out and, you know, get selling barbecue, it really only takes one person to do that running a one person operation is difficult, but I think it is one of the few types of food that you can really do. Uh, you really can pull off with one person. Um, but generally, if that one person started the business because they're really great at barbecue, they're probably not great at, at marketing, uh, probably not great at, uh, you know, keeping up with the books, all these different things as well. So yeah, there, there are a variety of reasons, but, uh, and the other thing, not, not just places that have closed, but the places that set themselves up not to make the next list. And that is just the way they react to being in the top 50. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to tell a barbecue joint, especially one that maybe has been struggling until they make the list to not just see this as a economic opportunity, um, but to see it as an opportunity to start to build your longer legacy. 
And if you see it just as an economic opportunity, you might be tempted to just fill the pits completely full, cook as much barbecue as you possibly can, uh, sell as much barbecue as you possibly can, and not pay as much attention to the quality of it. And, you know, if you, if you react that way, um, you're not going to be selling the same product that you got on the list for. And it's really going to be a detriment to, you know, your, your future uh, as far as the list goes. I'm, I'm kind of curious too, because, you know, we are a business communications podcast and a lar- large part really of, of business in, you know, the 2020s is social media. And we've seen a lot of barbecue joints blow up, whether it's on Instagram, whether it's through Twitter, Facebook, um, and even YouTube. I think YouTube has been a huge platform for just spreading, I guess, the knowledge of barbecue and also, mm-hmm. um, you know, highlighting different businesses. And I think of a place here in Houston, which is uh, Koi Barbecue. Um, you know, it's Viet Tex Barbecue, mm-hmm. and uh, they basically do pop-up shops throughout yeah. the city and the region. And they're, you know the visuals that they have, you know, are, are amazing on Instagram. You know, they have the ramen barbecue. There are, of course, briskets. I'm curious from your perspective, over the last 10 years, do you think the barbecue game in Texas and throughout the country has been elevated maybe a little bit more because of social media? Oh, absolutely. In in several ways, you know. I, I think the, uh, the way that barbecue is presented, I think a lot of barbecue joint owners and pitmasters understand that now the way they present their barbecue to the customer is so important visually because that is uh, probably going to end up as a photograph that is posted somewhere. And you want to have some control over what those little advertisements for your business are going to be. You know, take Leonard Botello uh, down at Truth Barbecue in Houston. Uh, You know, I and many others have noted the fact that like he became this sort of barbecue tray artist where everything had its place uh, and everything was arranged in a certain way to be visually stunning. And, you know, you, you take that into account with like the fact that now most barbecue is served on trays, not wrapped up in paper. Um, And those trays, uh, uh, you know, the, I think Instagram itself has sort of brought on this uh, influx of overhead shots. Like the overhead food shot has become like the sort of generic shot of food. And the way that that partners up with a tray of barbecue, it's just seamless. Uh, I've even you know, I've given talks to groups of, of barbecue joint owners with tips on how to present their barbecue better. And like one of my most simple ones is uh, when it comes to to-go containers, like buy black to-go containers instead of white ones. Like your food just looks better in them. Uh, the photographs from a black uh, styrofoam container look better than one from a white styrofoam container. Uh, just simple tips like that. Uh, but then also the fact that... Uh, all these smaller operations, even like a Koi barbecue, um, Houston's got all these pop-ups, uh, JU's Tex-Mex barbecue, uh, Eddie O's, like all these places that do these pop-ups and they understand that um, if they've got all these people posting the, these visuals for them to keep people um, uh, reminded of the fact that they're around and, and to follow their social media channels because you want to be able to, to get to that next pop-up. And the fact is, if you're running a pop-up and you're not on social media, like we just can't do it. Like you've got to have that uh, outreach to the public to be able to get people in um, to the, you know, the few and far between locations that you're going to be set up. Um, And then also just for, it makes my job easier and harder. Uh, All these people out there who are going around barbecue hunting, it certainly helps uh, in giving me leads of places to go to Uh, seeing all these different people post all these photos and, experiences that they have but it also means that it's almost impossible for me to find a great barbecue joint that nobody's heard of like it just it, it almost doesn't exist anymore it's interesting you say that because i know when your 2017 list a lot of people asked me about uh the barbecue and i was like there's two of them on the top 10 that i was like i hadn't even heard of usually i hear some sort of grumbling across the state that you need to go here you need to go there um and the, and the tejas chocolate was the one and i'm like How'd that one get there? I never knew that that was even in that part of the world. And it's got chocolate in the name. So that throws <laughs> people off too. They, they, tra- they changed their name from Tejas Chocolate Craftery to Tejas Chocolate and Barbecue. So it's a little more clear now. 
<laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Uh, we're gonna change change speed a little bit on this. I read an article about a year ago of um, your family being in Peru, COVID hitting, and having to rely on your network. Um, because we are business communicators and business things, networking is everything. I think one of our first guests said it best. Um, networking isn't part of the thing. Networking is your only thing. C can you kind of tell us a little bit about the story and about how you had to <laughs> utilize your network to get back home? Utilizing my network, uh, that might be a, a bit of a stretch. It was, I, I thought of it more as sort of a Hail Mary to uh, somebody who I'd had some minimal contacts with, but it ended up working out. Nicholas Gill is a food writer. And uh, he writes in, he's, he's lived in Peru um, and lived in the States as well and writes about Peruvian cuisine and Peruvian foodways, uh, really South American foodways. And uh, long ago, he had written an article in uh, Munchies about Brooklyn barbecue has taken over the world. And when he did, uh, when he wrote about it, he was really writing about the aesthetic of Brooklyn barbecue and the fact that he's found this aesthetic uh, of, of the restaurant and the food in several places around the world. Somebody then at Munchies decided to turn that into a headline that was uh, far more salacious or outlandish, I should say, than what he ever meant by the article. But of course, it's the headline that caught fire. Um, and this photo of barbecue that was, you know, less than impressive. Uh, that was attached to it, posted on Twitter four years after the article actually came out. So four years now in the world of barbecue is like a, a lifetime. Like the, the way that barbecue changes in four years is pretty dramatic. And so he got like thoroughly lambasted all over, all over Twitter. I came to his defense um, because I realized that this article is four years old. I read the article, realized it's not what it said. I interviewed him and posted... Uh, portions of our interview um, when all of Twitter was asking me to just pile on along with everyone else. So uh, I guess basically I just wasn't a jerk is what it boiled down to. Uh, several years later, I was in Peru with my family. Uh, we were at the top of Machu Picchu on March 15th of 2020. Um, that evening, we were back at our hotel in uh, Cusco and the president of uh, Peru announced they were going to close the borders in 24 hours or 28 hours from the time that we heard it. We booked a flight to get out of town the next day, uh, showed up at the airport and uh, there was there was no flight. Uh, couldn't get in on the flight. We were told we we're going to have to just stay in the country for a couple of weeks and they'd reopen the borders. Uh, by the way, the borders still are not fully reopened in Peru. Um, so we were told about two weeks, we'd have to wait and to just go find a hotel, um, kindly by the military with guns, pushing everyone out of the airport. Uh, and so we found a hotel, stayed there for a few days and, uh, in the airport in Cusco, when it looked like, uh, maybe this flight from Lima back home wasn't going to happen. I just reached out to Nicholas Gill and said, Hey, you're the only person I know. Uh, who has really any connection to Peru. I don't know if you're here right now. I don't know, even know if you can help. I don't even know if I'll need help. But I figured I'd at least uh, lay some groundwork right now. And he got back to me and just said, you know, just let me know. Uh, let me know if you ever need any help. I, I've got some contacts, might be able to. And so reached out again once we were stuck in the hotel. Uh, and then the day we were supposed to go eat at Central, this great restaurant in Lima. Uh, so Rogelio Martinez uh, runs the place. He's a just really well-known chef and like one of Peru's best chefs. And we had reservations at his place, which obviously we couldn't go to. Everything was shut down. Um, everything but the markets and banks and doctor's offices. Uh, so we couldn't go to this restaurant, but uh, I get a call at the hotel from Virgilio, a guy I'd never met, never talked to. We had just watched his Netflix special on our way down to get like pumped up for our meal there. He's like, so this is Daniel. Huh? Uh, do you, uh, I hear you need some help getting out of the country. <laughs> like, yes. So a uh, couple of uh, like within a day, he had called me back and asked me over the phone for my credit card number. So he could charge $1,300 to my credit card. Again, never met uh, a lot of trust right there. And uh, he said he'd have four plane tickets for me. And uh, for, for me and my wife and my two kids. And he came through and the next morning we showed up at the airport, stood outside the gates of the airport for several hours. And finally somebody came, um, 
took all 175 of us inside the airport and we got on a plane back to Miami and then flew to DFW from there uh, to get back home. So it was a wild ride for sure. Uh, we take a big trip every spring break uh, to see the world, to show my kids the world. And, uh, they certainly got, we got more of it than we bargained for that trip, but we did get to see Machu Picchu the day, the final day that it was open to the public. Uh, it's reopened now, but for quite a few months it was closed to the public. And uh, we at least got to see that uh, and have a experience that was certainly different than any of our other spring break appearances before. You know, I was just thinking about something. The subject in terms of what you talk about, you know, in terms of barbecue and, you know, the readers and what they look for, how do you continually keep your audiences engaged around the subject of barbecue? Uh, not just going to a restaurant, not just eating, but what what do you think keeps them coming back? Early on in Texas Monthly, my coverage was mostly about restaurants and was and most of that coverage was about food and you think as a food writer of course you know that's what you're supposed to write about right but i learned that the thing that kept people especially people outside of the barbecue community uh, more engaged in the stories was stories about people and these days i really don't write a story about a restaurant and its food if i can't talk to somebody who works there or runs the place or owns the place and get part of their story uh, about what motivated them for, for opening up, what motivates them to, to cook barbecue, uh, what excites them about barbecue. So the stories about people, uh, I think, resonate with certainly people outside of the barbecue community more than, uh, more than just, you know, real details about the food. Um, and so that's one of the ways that I've changed my coverage, I think, to keep people engaged. Uh, my editor would tell you uh, recipes, recipes, recipes. You got to get the recipe because <laughs> that's the one that brings all the people in. So I do write some recipes. I write more, certainly more now than I ever did before. But uh, I try to find something unique to do rather than, you know, here's how Daniel Vaughn would smoke a brisket. Like, like you mentioned before, YouTube, they've got 50 different ways to cook a brisket. Um, you know, there's there's professionals who do it every day who can tell you a lot better than I. Uh, but, you know, if there's uh, some some different cuts out there, some interesting cuts, I've got some lamb in the freezer right now. I'm going to uh, going to thaw that out next week and try some uh, lamb shoulder burnt ends and uh, try the same seasoning on a boneless leg of lamb and smoke it, uh, cook it more to like medium rare and slice it. Um, and so I'm going to try those two side by side and and uh, if it turns out well, uh, do a recipe. I mean, everybody makes, people make burnt ends out of just about anything these days, uh, but I haven't seen lamb burnt ends anywhere and I think it's time. So, so the three of us will show up at your house at what time? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, as, as we're getting close to the end of time here um, and, and you mentioned that the next list of the Texas top, Texas top 50 or I like to say the best 50 barbecue joints in the world because we all know that bar Texas barbecue is a little bit better. Yes, there's some places that are starting to play with there. Um, it's probably more discussed than uh, coach changes at some of the college universities. Uh, what, what kind of uh, offense is the Dallas Cowboys going to run or what kind of, who's going to be quarterback for the Houston Texans? I think for about six months, that is the most discussed topic at any water cooler across Texas pertaining uh, compared to sports so for our people are there any barbecue joints that you would recommend us trying now before it becomes a three-hour line or five-hour line or an hour line at some of these places yeah uh is there a city you have in mind or just anywhere in texas let's go with the big let's go with the big cities like can you give us one in dallas one in austin one in houston okay and then maybe a wild card somewhere all right let's see well uh so <clears throat> Dallas is my home. I love Dallas, uh, but Fort Worth is kicking our butt and uh, <laughs> when it comes to barbecue these days. Uh, so I can give you actually a few. I mean, um, Goldie's Barbecue out in Fort Worth is doing amazing things. Uh, and that's Goldie's with two E's. Uh, Hurtado Barbecue in Arlington. Uh, it's in the mid-cities right in between Dallas and Fort Worth. Amazing stuff. Derek Allen's in Fort Worth as well uh, Zavala's barbecue in Grand Prairie they've been closed for a, a couple of months now to the big ice storm just reopened um, and 
I, I mean, somebody's going to be mad because I'm leaving somebody out because I'm telling you, like, Fort Worth is where it's at. Like, if you're going to – if you want to plan a barbecue trip right now that's going to hit some unknown places uh, or at least not known statewide, then uh, Fort Worth is your place right now for sure. Um, let's see. Down in Houston right now. Uh, you know, it's an oldie but a goodie uh, right outside of Houston. Dozier's Barbecue in Katy uh, – sorry, uh, in Fullshear outside of Katy. Um, they're doing great things. and it's been around a really long time, but Jim Buchanan has taken over the pits there and is mixing, uh, you know, some new barbecue techniques with a, a lot of the old stuff they've done for a long time. Um, let's see. Uh, if I had this, if I had a map in front of me, uh, I mean, I'll say, I'll just say right now, I haven't even written an article about it yet. I haven't even interviewed them yet, but the, the most exciting like I got to get back to this place as soon as I possibly can is uh, burnt bean company barbecue in Seguin, Texas. Uh, I, I can't even begin to tell you how good that meal was. I, I had two meals there in one day. I went for breakfast. They do breakfast on Sundays. So I went for breakfast at 9 a.m. Got a brisket huevos rancheros, barbacoa taco, mollejas taco, brisket taco. Uh, came back for lunch an hour and 45 minutes later and i mean it was uh yeah hour and 45 minutes later had nearly the full menu i didn't do the beef rib because that would have been wasteful uh and the sliced brisket the ribs the the sides this uh, corn pudding and green beans with tomatoes and bacon i mean it was just it was a really stunning meal uh so that's certainly a newer place that i think people in san antonio have have heard about but uh, I don't think a whole lot of people around the state have heard about that one just yet. Let's see, down in Austin. I mean, I've been singing their praises forever, but Leroy and Lewis uh, in Austin is just like, it's, it's hard to beat. Uh, everything, every time they have a special on, it's gonna be great. Uh, all, all, everything on the base menu is great. And Evan Leroy is the pit master there and he just keeps, his timing just sucks. It, uh, he is, keeps moving from barbecue joint to barbecue joint, like at, right before I make them a top 50 or uh, anything like that. But, um, you know, they'll, they'll be around for this next top 50 and uh, unless something goes horribly wrong there. Um, I mean, they were in our top 25 best new barbecue joint list, but uh, yeah, Leroy and Lewis is, is doing really special things there. But the, the newest one that I found, and this one's still certainly under the radar just because it is so new is distant relatives in austin and it's a new food truck um so damian brockway is the pit master there and he's it, it looks like a texas barbecue menu and um but there's just more to it um he's using a lot of west african spices uh he's got a west african spice blend that he's using on every cut of meat he's decided that austin has enough brisket he's doing smoked chuck he feels like smoked chuck uh he, he thinks it's a better piece of meat. Um, and, and really just the fact that brisket, there's plenty of great brisket options there. And then his side side items are just, he was a chef, uh, he's a trained chef who's worked fine dining, uh, tasting menu restaurants beforehand. And he uh, he's taken a lot of that knowledge of building flavors into the sides that he's putting out. And uh, he's also, uh, he, he calls his barbecue modern African-American barbecue. Uh, and he's doing so much of that, obviously through the meats and the seasonings, but I see it most through the sides that he's offering and doing black eyed, burn in black eyed peas using the, uh, the, the skirt steak or the skirt portion of the pork spare ribs to, to smoke it and chop it up, put it in the black eyed peas, smothered cabbage um, made with a pork stock and carrots. Uh, whipped uh, sweet potatoes, uh, whipped brown butter sweet potatoes. He has a pan of brown butter back in the food truck that has uh, his West African spice blend in it that if you get Texas toast, it's in that butter. Uh, he finishes off his smoked chicken quarters in uh, a hot pan of that butter to get it crisp. Uh, I stopped in there when it was a month old and I told myself like, I got a lot of places to go to today. I'm going to get like one or two sandwiches from here just to get a preview and i'm moving on and it smelled so good the menu looked so good i was like all right four meats four sides put it down and left that place so excited and it ruined my day 
uh, because it was my first stop and I ate way too much. And then I had five places after that to eat. So uh, ruined my day in the best of ways. So that, that's one that's definitely off the radar right now, but I think will become uh, much more well-known here before too long. I, I think is that it, enough? I, I, yeah, <laughs> I I think maybe you ruined my day a little bit because now all I can think about is like barbecue and I'm incredibly hungry and yeah, I could just see like all of us like salivating as you were describing the sides and uh, yeah, but <laughs> anyways, I will definitely have to get some barbecue this weekend, but uh, Daniel Vaughn, thank you so much for joining us on the Business Communicators podcast and I know that you're pretty active on social media, so for our listeners out there that uh, maybe they don't follow you. Uh, what is the best way for them to connect with you? And I guess, what else are you working on that, you know, maybe our listeners should keep on the radar? Well, um, so I've got, uh, you know, uh, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I'm on most of those. I'm on those most of the time. At BBQ Snob is my handle on both of those. I don't spend very much time on Facebook. It's a cesspool. <laughs> and um, uh, what I'm working on right now, uh, or you can also email me, uh, dvon at texasmonthly.com. Uh, I get plenty of emails of, of places that people uh, are recommending me go travel to and try. I'm always happy to get those recommendations. And, uh, you know, really my focus for most of the rest of this year is going to be our top 50. Um, like I said, we're going to kick that meeting off here real soon with all of our tasters who are going to be going around the state. Uh, as we compile that list for, it'll be in our November issue. So it'll be coming out in uh, late October. Um Usually it's our June issue, but for obvious reasons, we thought pushing it, uh, pushing the research side and pushing the promotion of road tripping around Texas to, uh, you know, five, six months later was uh, prudent. And so that's really what I'm going to be spending most of my time on. So uh, as you see all the write ups that I have on Texas Monthly uh, from here until now, I'll be writing up all those visits as well. I mean, I'm certainly not going to tell you if they're going to make the top 50 or not, but uh, it might be kind of easy to tell which ones I might favor and which ones I might not. Uh, but then any of our tasters could be out there as well and knock them off the list. So they had a terrible meal there and we don't want to send anybody out for a terrible meal um, from our top 50 list. So that's going to be uh, a big part of, of the year upcoming. So uh, it's nice to get back out on the road, fully vaccinated. Woo and uh, yeah, ready to eat more barbecue. Yeah, all of us are fully vaccinated as well. So we uh, we hope to get on the road and we can't wait to see that that issue when it releases in October and, and maybe do a little business communicators road trip ourselves. That sounds like it should be in store. But Daniel Vaughn, thank you so much for joining us on the business communicators this week. All right. Well, thank you all. It was good talking with you. You're listening to the business communicators. Special thanks to Daniel Vaughn for joining us on the Business Communicators podcast. And Thomas, I know you were like a kid in a candy shop. And Hattie, I could see you as well as me salivating when he was talking about all the sides <laughs> and the food options. I mean, I, I was kind of disappointed that we did this interview because it just got me hungry for 30 minutes. <laughs> well, you know, um, I what I really liked about it is that and what was really interesting to me, because we're talking about food we're talking about barbecue but i love how he was able to uh help me understand you know how does he keep his audiences engaged mm -hmm. in this subject on an ongoing basis to be sustainable and to be interesting and to keep the readers coming back so i thought that was just really good um to know as a communicator you know you have to be able to engage your audiences i, I thought that was really neat but also talking about um how how restaurants handle the success, you know, pump up meat and not stay on the list. But I thought the other part that I thought was really interesting was the power of networking because we're business communicators and we're always networking. And even if it's somebody you casually met or somebody that you met on LinkedIn, being able to reach out to them to ask for help. I thought that was a real interesting story about his time a year ago. Yeah, I, I think that is interesting as well. But there was another takeaway that I had is that you can have one career path. You can start off as an architect and you can still have a hobby. And if that hobby is something that you're good at, you know, maybe you can parlay it into something. You know, Daniel started a blog and now he's one of the most respected names in barbecue working for a prestigious publication like Texas Monthly. But if you want to follow his work, just search Barbecue Snob on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's just going to provide great content. And we hope that you enjoyed the conversation. Um, yeah, it was fun. It was different. It was. It really, really was. I love how he turned his passion and he got it. He, he gets paid for it now. 
Yeah. Isn't that cool? That's cool. You get paid to eat barbecue. That, that's that got to be the life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the off the record when he's like, when I'm doing six barbecue joints in a day and, you know, you're parlaying that two days in a row, he might think at certain times, but eating barbecue every day is not so great. But, yeah. and, and I have a story that I did the same where, I'm not going to lie, i do it again in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I do like how they are releasing the... Uh, you know, the top 50 barbecue spots in Texas. It comes out every four years. As Daniel said, the, the next publication will be the November issue of Texas Monthly, which comes out in late October. So be on the lookout for that. And uh, it's really going to encourage you to take road trips throughout the state of Texas. Go with your friends, uh, visit some of these locations, and, and just really enjoy it. And uh, Daniel mentioned that he's fully vaccinated. And uh, I actually got my second vaccination uh this week and i do want to give like a little i guess shout out real quick uh to houston health department so i was very frustrated with trying to get my second dose scheduled um there were a lot of technical issues for the the vaccine you know the text message registration system didn't work and there were a lot of there was a lot of animosity on social media and i definitely you know after being on hold for four hours being transferred from one place to another i was really frustrated so i actually tweeted houston health department and uh, they were great about responding and giving me updates and so um i guess my takeaway is just be patient i know that's easier said than done for me being patient wasn't necessarily the best thing but kudos to you houston health department and what they're doing to get people vaccinated uh, here. So if you haven't gotten your jab, get the jab. Highly recommend it. So you can go eat some barbecue. But <laughs> how about we close the episode with some 400 writing prompts? Is that Does that sound good? Does that work? Works for me. It works for me. Let's do it. All right. I'm going to flip to your random page again. Open it up. All right. And our topic this week, you're 10 years old and opening a lemonade stand. Describe what it looks like and what you would say to potential customers to get a sale. Do you serve barbecue on the side? <laughs> <laughs> so you're 10 years old, opening up your lemonade stand. What do you tell customers to get that sale? Well, in my neighborhood, and I was 10 years old, and I had a lemonade stand. My neighbors are actually very, they're very generous. We take care of one another. They saw me out there. First of all, I'd be painted purple. Because that's my favorite color. Not because of Prince. Because when I was little, he wasn't even around. Because I'm royalty. And the purple would be accented with maybe a red or an orange. Who knows? And I'd have my cups all organized. And, 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 and because I like to talk to people, I didn't care who passed me by. Hey, Pookie, come here for a minute. Let me talk to you. That's me and Tim. I have some awesome lemonade. All it's going to cost you is whatever I would charge. My expensive taste would probably be 50 cents. 50 cents. I don't have two quarters. Sure you do. You have two quarters, but you haven't tasted my lemonade. Taste the lemonade. <laughs> I don't want to buy the lemonade. So that's that's kind of me. <laughs> but that's with the other kids. But with the grown-ups, I know that's kind of like mine. If they know you, they like you, they'll buy it. And People like me, so they buy it. I, I think I think for me, I would, I would try to just be personable. You know, um, going back to you know what Thomas mentioned and, and Daniel mentioned, relationships matter, networking matters. And at ten years old, I I I wanted to be friends with like everybody, and so I would try to be friends with potential customers and maybe get them to to spend fifty cents, seventy five cents, whatever that is. But fun fact, when I was in uh, middle school, I would actually go to Sam's Club and I would buy Airheads. And I would sell them for a quarter each or five for a dollar. And uh, I would also go and buy Coca-Cola and Sprite. And I would bring like, like a little cooler to, uh, to school. <laughs> and I would, I think the vending machine sold them at like 75 cents. And I think I sold them for 50 cents. But I was still mm. making a profit because I was getting them at Sam's Club. Uh, so yeah, I had a little entrepreneurial spirit in me when I was 10, you 11 years old. You had a side hustle. <laughs> I was about to say, the side hustle before yeah, the it became side the side hustle. the side hustle before the side hustle. <laughs> Too funny. Thomas, what about you? Um, I actually remember having a lemonade stand, but it wasn't really a lemonade stand. It was a Kool-Aid stand because we got bored with lemonade. Um, and so we, we went to the thing and bought a bunch of little packets of the Kool-Aid. So we had every color flavor under the, under the, under the stars. 
which was probably one of the mistakes we made was too much selection. But I remember drastic. I remember clearly selling one at a time. But then we said, you buy one, you get one free. So whatever flavor you wanted, you could have one, two different flavors, anything like that. And I remember the sales actually working. Um, and, and it was just, it was just interesting. But it was the same thing of being personal, calling people over, getting them to talk. I think we were charging a quarter a piece or something like that. Um, but yeah, I remember my brother and I getting out there and and hustling away. That's too great. Well, if you do open up a lemonade stand and you are here in Texas, we'd encourage you to maybe play Beyonce's album, Lemonade. I think that could maybe get you some extra customers here. Uh, that in, depends in on the appropriateness. Not all the lyrics maybe. are appropriate. Fair. Fair. Come on now. Fair. Fair. A 10 year old playing Beyonce's <laughs> Lemonade. Mm. All right, maybe Hattie has a good point, but anyways, <laughs> drop it in the comments below. What would you do? What was you, what would your sales strategy or communication strategy be at the at the age of ten, opening up a lemonade stand? Uh, let us know. Drop it in the comments below, or uh, text us feedback if you want. And again, our text line, you can reach us. Uh, that is, gosh, what is it? Seven one three three six zero zero one three three. So text podcast seven one three three six zero zero one three three. But Guys, I really enjoyed uh, today's episode. We had a, a great interview with Daniel Vaughn. And of course, we encourage you to follow Daniel on his social media platforms. Just search BBQ Snob on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow all of his you know, incredible journeys and road trips throughout the state of Texas as he finds uh, the unique stories that make barbecue barbecue and the people behind it. Uh, I, I think it's it's he's a great storyteller and uh, he gets to eat barbecue for a living. So that's just absolutely incredible. But if you want to follow our work, just search biz communicator on all of the social media platforms. We're there. You can find us. And, and Thomas, Hattie, any final takeaways for the week? I'm all vaccinated. So I'm just happy. I'm happy. I'm telling folks, go and get it done and be safe. Have a good week. Have a good week. I still wear my mask, especially indoors, just because uh, of the respect level of it and the simply example. Um, but, you know, be kind to one another. You never know who's going to help you out. And uh, eat some barbecue. If you're in Texas, eat some of the best barbecue in the world. Yeah. In fact, I think I'm going to have to go get some this weekend now. Well, I think we're all going to get barbecue this weekend. I think that just makes logical sense after having an interview with Daniel. But on behalf of our guests this week, Daniel Vaughn and my co-host Thomas Bain and Hattie Horn, my name's Austin Statton, and we'll see you next week. You've been listening to The Business Communicators. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and leave us a five-star review.